har det stora barriärevet i Australien på att dö. Ja, om man tittar på de resultat man får fram i Google när man skriver in stora barriärevet så dyker det först upp en artikel från Wikipedia. Scrollar vi lite längre ner så dyker det upp lite resesajter och sen kommer vi till larmrapporterna från vår svenska media. Den första rapporten som vi har här, eller den första länken vi kommer till är SVT. Deras rubrik lyder Ny rapport, dåliga framtidsutsikter för stora barriärevet. Vi går lite längre ner, då har vi resesajter och sen dyker det upp... Eh, en tidning som, eller en sajt som heter extrakt.se. Ny forskning ska rädda stora barriärevet. Så går vi till sidan två och kika vad vi har där. Då skriver Aftonbladet. Enormt pimpstensblock kan rädda stora barriärevet. Aftonbladet kommer också direkt under med en rubrik som är halva stora barriärevet dött eller döende. Därunder kommer eh, Världsnaturfonden. Eh, konstgödsel hotar stora barriärevet. Och så fortsätter vi lite mer längre ner. Och då har vi lite resesajter. Eh, och sen kommer vi till någonting som heter Supermiljöbloggen. Rubriken, eller undertexten där som dyker, nej, rubriken är Stora barriärevet är döende. Och så står det under detta då, under supermiljöbloggen så står det Det är kanske ingen nyhet att stora barriärevet riskerar att utrotas. Men nu slår världens mest framstående korallforskare larm om att läget är ännu mer akut. Under så har vi en rubrik från Svenska Dagbladet, stora barriärevet. Och där har man samlat artiklar, olika artiklar om... Stora barriärevet då och naturligtvis så står det någonting om klimathot och biologiskt mångfald. Vi går vidare till sidan tre och ser vad som dyker upp där. Då har vi alltså Expressen dyker upp här. Forskarnas metod ska rädda korallrevet, korallerna i stora barriärevet. Och sen kommer en resesajt igen. TV4 skriver här, så dåligt mår stora barriärevet. Det var fruktansvärt att se. Riktig skrämt för propaganda. Sydsvenskan kommer med en rubrik, kritiskt tillstånd för stora barriärevet. Vi går vidare och ser vad som dyker upp på sidan 4. DN, därför är stora barriärevet på väg att tappa färgen. Och sen har vi Göteborgsposten. Hoppet dör för stora barriärevet. Vi misslyckades. Sveriges Radio. Australiens kolexport hotar stora barriärevet. Och så här fortsätter det om man går vidare. Det är en del resesajter och sen är det en massa, massa larmrapporter om hur revet håller på att dö. Här har vi kuriren.nu. Kritiskt tillstånd för stora barriärevet. Ja, och det finns någon artikel som inte går i den här riktningen och larmar för att revet håller på att dö. Men det man undrar här nu då, det är ju vad har de fått den här informationen ifrån och är det här sant? I den australiensiska showen Pellow Talk intervjuar journalisten David Pellow forskaren Dr. Peter Ridd. Dr. Peter Ridd undervisade och studerade under nästan 40 år vid James Cook universitetet i Queensland i Australien. 2017 gick han ut och varnade för att forskningen kring stora barriärevet inte har kontrollerats. Han gick också ut och sa att stora korallrevet inte alls är döende utan tvärtom mår bra. På grund av att han gick ut offentligt med detta så anklagade Jens Cook universitetet honom för allvarligt tjänstefel och bela honom i munkavle. Han vägrade dock vara tyst. Istället så inledde han en kamp för att återupprätta den akademiska friheten och han kämpar för att vetenskapen ska ha bättre kvalitetskontroller. Det har nämligen visat sig att uppemot 50% av den expertgranskade så kallade peer review vetenskapen som publicerats i vetenskapliga tidskrifter är fel. 
Detta har diskuterats intensivt i forskarvärlden och går under namnet The Replication Crisis på engelska. Det svenska namnet är Replikationskrisen. Den information om stora barriärer som nått ut till allmänheten via mainstream media, media bygger på ett dussin vetenskapliga tidskrifter vars forskning är minst sagt bristfällig enligt Dr. Peter Reed. C.S. Lewis commented in a 1958 article titled Willing Slaves of the Welfare State that Again, the new oligarchy must more and more base its claim to plan us on its claim to knowledge. If we are to be mothered, mother must know best. This means they must increasingly rely on the advice of scientists till in the end the politicians proper become merely the scientists puppets. I dread government in the name of science. That is how tyrannies come in. In every age, the men who want us under their thumb, if they have any sense, will put forward the particular pretension which the hopes and fears of that age render most potent. They cash in. It has been magic. It has been Christianity. Now it will certainly be science. Perhaps the real scientists may not think much of the tyrants, science. They didn't think much of Hitler's racial theories or Stalin's biology. But they can be muzzled. A highly celebrated thinker and philosopher of the last century, Lewis raises an important question that should continue to concern you and I today. Can science be corrupted without adequate quality controls? And if so, who would warn the general population that they were being manipulated? Lewis argued that not only could science be corrupted, but that our governments certainly would manipulate us with conveniently interpreted science which our trendy emotions would give power to. Extremist environmentalists are past masters at this, and the shrill alarmism with which they hyperventilate about imminent catastrophe for the Great Barrier Reef is a perfect example. Politicians, desperate to retain their white-knuckled grip on the reins of power, trumpet peer-reviewed science in the hopes that the 9% of willfully ignorant Greens voters and a handful of inner-city seats will be gullible enough to worship the golden calf of scientism and grant them those one or two extra seats in Parliament needed to preserve their oligarchy. And as C.S. Lewis observed, real scientists didn't think much of the tyrant's science, but they can be muzzled. Dr. Peter Ridd is one such real scientist who had the audacity to publicly call for better quality control of science, the science being relied upon to determine public policy and billion dollar public expenditure. He raised the alarm last year that the science regarding the Great Barrier Reef has not been checked. He explained that Australian coral reefs that have supposedly lost all their coral are in fact covered in healthy coral. Reefs that are supposedly smothered in sediments are not. Reefs that have been damaged by cyclones and bleaching have rapidly recovered because these are natural phenomena. And so, just as C.S. Lewis and George Orwell prophesied, Dr. Peter Ridd was muzzled. The James Cook University, where he'd studied and taught for nearly 40 years, objected to his public discussion of the inadequacy of research surrounding the Great Barrier Reef, and they began disciplinary proceedings for professional misconduct. Wanting to provide context and explanation around their punitive actions, and to mount a strong legal defence, he also discussed that publicly and opened a GoFundMe, which James Cook University also rebuked him for and forbade any further public comment about. You and I should be concerned about academic freedom being replaced by academic authoritarianism. Because the inevitable result of universities like James Cook firing professors like Dr. Peter Ridd will be the lack of accountability for bad science, science which governments will then use to manipulate us into supporting bad government. Joining me in this episode of Pello Talk is former James Cook University professor Dr. Peter Ridd. 
to discuss the differences between science we can trust and science we should question further. What's really going on in the Great Barrier Reef and his personal experience as a real scientist being muzzled for questioning tyrannical science, as described by C.S. Lewis. Warning, you are now entering a diversity zone where different opinions are tolerated. This is not a safe space. This is Pelo Talk. Welcome to Pelo Talk, uh, Dr. Ridd. How are you? Very well, thank you. Excellent. Now, you've actually had uh, the rough end of the pineapple uh, over the last uh, few months, but I actually want to start at the beginning and, and just help my viewers to understand uh, and be immunized against the really, really bad levels of, of ignorance about science that um, politicians and extreme environmentalists will exploit and take advantage of. Uh, what exactly is good science? And what are some of the, the pitfalls um, that, that we need to be aware of when we hear people on, in the media and, and political um, campaigns? Um, touting? What, what are the, the common things that you've seen, the, the myths perpetuated? Right. Well, there's science and there's not science. There's, um, science is something which has been checked, tested and replicated. And the more it's been checked and tested and replicated, so you know the, the bounds of what it applies to and its accuracy, uh, that, that becomes, I suppose, good science. So, for example, the Newton's laws of motions, which have been around for a few hundred years, they are checked, tested and replicated effectively billions of times every day, every time you drive over a bridge, you fly in an aeroplane, the, the pistons in your car are flying up and down. This is all Newton's laws of motion. Mm -hmm. and they work and we know that you actually rely on those with your life every day. Now, at the other extreme, you've got well, <laughs> sometimes what's called the peer-reviewed science, right? And if it's only been peer-reviewed and it hasn't been checked, tested and replicated, then it's actually not science. Peer review is, sounds very impressive, but it's actually where a couple of people who are anonymous, they could be your mates, they may not be your mates, will have a quick look over your work and say, yeah, it looks all right, and that goes into a journal. So when somebody says the science has been peer reviewed, you should laugh, okay, because that's not science. With the, you say the people are anonymous, is the writer of the work that they are reviewing anonymous is no, it norm normally not so the reviewers uh -huh. know who the writer is but not the other way around that lends itself to an incredible amount of bias uh, it does so there are all sorts of problems with it um but you know it's a reasonable system for a first pass you know all right it's worthwhile in my view peer review you've got to do it um and then once it's been peer reviewed and if you're now going to use it to do other science or for public policy now we've got to do it again and again and again and make sure this really works. And the problem is that mm. when checks are actually done on a science that has just been peer reviewed, we regularly find with incredible, it's, this is an incredible statistic, that about 50% of peer reviewed science is wrong. Wow. This is, it's called the replication crisis. It's become a big issue in science. Uh, all the major journals are talking about it, but the implications mm. of it haven't seemed to have filtered down to the public and also the science bodies are not actually accepting what the, the implications of it. You know, just to back you up, I'll include a link uh, in the description beneath this video and we'll include lots of links so people can do further research, research and, and confirmation of, of what we're claiming in this interview. Yeah. Um, but to, to back you up, um, I read an article by um, a former editor of the Lancet Medical Journal who, who basically said that exactly that, that up to half or, or maybe more of all um, scientific research is, is wrong. Um, and the peer review process is inherently um, lends itself to bias and cronyism. It's just not enough. Mm. That's the problem. Now, it doesn't actually matter if a lot of these scientific results are wrong, provided you don't do anything based on them. But if you right. use that as a basis to do more science, which is building on a, a, a foundation that's not a good foundation, or worse still, if a government uses that, now mm. you've got a real problem. And my mm. argument has been, all right, peer review is fine, but you need to do much, much more if you're going to use that as a basis. And it, it, but it's a very, very frightening statistic. Um, and it's something which science has got to do something about. And they are starting to, to work on it. But the implications of 50 years of science which much of which is based on uh, poor 
a poor foundation is actually quite an, a nasty thought. So in a nutshell, what you're saying is peer reviewed science isn't the golden calf that we should all worship at. It's, it's not an ironclad silver bullet guaranteed infallible theory or fact of, of claim. You often hear scientists say, Oh, this is peer reviewed research. And, and I think, I, I think you are joking, aren't you? Is that all? Um, you know, there's been so much peer reviewed science has been shown mm. to be complete, ru completely rubbish and wrong. Mm. Um, there have been, there's lots of celebrated things in science now. I mean, even, you know, when I was a, a young fellow, they were saying how, um, you know, eating lots of saturated fat was causing heart disease and all these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And now they seem to be thinking, well, maybe it's not the saturated fat. Now mm. it's all peer reviewed stuff and there was a lot built on it. And, um, and now, well, maybe the whole thing is wrong now, but if you go to Newton's laws of motion, if you go to a, a classical textbook that comes from the 1950s in physics, mm -hmm. basically 99% of that will be right, okay? Because that's not just peer reviewed. That's been used in a whole lot of things. Uh, engineers have to use it. And when an engineer uses science, it's got to work. Otherwise, somebody dies, all right? Or mm. it's broke. Mm. But in environmental science or biomedical science, uh, where it's a little bit sort of wishy washy and soft. Yeah, uh, you can get away for many, many decades with mm. this stuff being completely wrong, especially with all the other nasty business that can come in, in science where groups of scientists will get together and gang up on the dissenters. Mm. Um, you know, things if people are dying, that doesn't happen, all right? But right. if they're not dying because of it, uh, then these almost myths can be perpetuated in mm. science uh, for many, many decades. Well, that actually probably leads me to my next question. We often hear, especially in the environmental sciences, that 97% of scientists agree. Uh, is science democratic? Is, is a overwhelming majority of agreement among scientists something we should put confidence in? I think it's something you can look at, but you shouldn't necessarily put confidence on it, especially when you see the bad behaviour that goes in science, right? I mean... Um, there only needs to be one experiment that shows that the other 97% are wrong and that's it, you know, with, with Einstein's wow. theory of relativity, which is, which also is check tested and replicated every time you use a GPS, right? So GPS actually uses Einsteinian uh, theory of relativity to get the accuracy. Um, if it turned out there was a problem there only once, and it was a definite, you know, you could keep on replicating this error again and again and again, then the theory is wrong and it has to be thrown out or modified in some form. Um, so it's uh, before Einstein came along, 99.999% of scientists thought that, uh, well, the previous theory was correct, which was basically the Galilean type of stuff. And, but, and Einstein really um, said, well, when things are going very fast, you have to modify the theory to make it more accurate. And we now know that that is correct. And you can rely on that with your life. Wow. Uh, you would not rely on 97% of scientists. Mm. Um, that is not, that is not science. That is just a statement. It's a political statement. I think. Well, that's something I, I often see in, in, you know, the, the social media debates that, that I engage in where people will claim this, this massive number of, of scientists. And I'm like, hang on, a massive number of scientists have been wrong so many times in history. Yes. Like uh, the, the geocentric theory of, you know, Earth being fixed in space and the universe and our solar system revolving around us. That was, you know, overwhelmingly peer reviewed quality research once. Well, in, in its day, it had its own. That, that's right. Its own. Way they, they checked it. <laughs> that's um, right. But you could go to Russia, for example, and there's a, a completely different view in Russia about climate science. Uh, they are far, far, far more sceptical. I don't know what the percentage of climate scientists in Russia don't believe it, but it would be much, much more than 3% that don't believe it. Um, now, why is that? Uh, it's the same science, but why if you're Russian, suddenly 
uh, people are less likely to believe it than otherwise. It means because it's not good science. That's what mm. it actually means. Because I can assure you, 100% of Russian physicists believe in Einstein's theory of relativity and the Newton's laws of motion and thermodynamics. <laughs> but, you know, because it's been so brutally checked, tested and replicated over the years, but that is not the case for some of this other... Is it perhaps because there are less globalists in um, Russian government? I, th I think so, and I think that there are, that the Russians have a political view of of why a lot of this climate science has come about. They recognise very clearly when they see an authoritarian group of people, in this case, the science, the science organisations, stamping their authority on anybody. They see that because they've lived with that throughout the Soviet period, and they're probably looking at more of it nowadays. Um, with their, their own political situation. So they can recognize when these things are happening. But anyway, that's an interesting philosoph philosophical point. Why are the Russians fundamentally mm. their outlook on climate? Mm. Well, it's, it's sad that, uh, sorry, what were you saying? And maybe it's just because it's very cold there and they don't see the disadvantage. <laughs> it's a lot more than that. Well, uh, look, that's, a, that's an interesting tangent, um, which is probably worth pursuing, uh, you know, if briefly, will the world really come to an end if we're, if we're a bit warmer and the oceans are a bit higher? Well, no, I mean, this is the point. One degree, uh, you know, maybe we warm by one degree, which in, in the, which in the historical context is nothing. I mean, we were, we were one or two degrees hotter in the Egyptian period. Right. I mean, that's not that long ago, just a few thousand years ago. You mean when the pyramids were being built? Yes. When the pyramids were being built, the world was about this. It's very well known in, in geological circle. It's called the Holocene Climatic Optimum. Notice the, the, the name Optimum mm. because we were at our warmest. And generally speaking, warm is better. Cold is bad. Ice ages are bad things. Just yeah. Was that the age when um, when they were able to, you know, harvest, um, you know, raise harvests of, of crops in green? land and grow grapes in England? That's, that's even more recent. So now we're talking about um, less than a thousand years ago, maybe 800 years ago that they, you know, crops in Greenland, Iceland, these sorts of things. Wow. It's in Kent in the south of England. Mm. So, you know, this is the thing, the climate changes by one, one degree every few hundred or a thousand years. And that's mm. why the small change we've got at the moment yeah, it could be due to CO2, but it could be entirely natural as well. Are there any other myths? We've got the, uh, I guess, the limited usefulness of peer review and the limited usefulness of uh, a majority of scientists. Mm. Are there any other things that are, are touted as, as um, good science which we should be wary of? Well, I think... Um, when you get a bunch of science organisations, even like the Australian Academy of Science or the Royal Society, putting out these consensus statements, you want to be really worried about those consensus statements because that's just a, a, a group of scientists getting together to try to stamp their authority in many cases. Right. Um, so, no. Uh, you can look at science and tell whether it's good science by whether it's being checked, tested and replicated again and again and again and again, and it always gives the same results. It's actually quite easy to do. Now, often in biomedical areas, we've had these things come around and they've, they've, for many, many, you know, almost decades, and they've been found to be wrong. But if you actually go back to when it originally occurred, you can actually see, well, they never did it properly in the first place. <laughs> they never had an excuse to get it wrong. Uh, so I think that's really the, the other example of where you can actually check to see whether stuff is wrong or not. Do you think, um, do you think there's a, a danger that um, scientists as educated and esteemed and high calibre as they are in their field overstep their qualifications and, and go from um, establishing the research and articulating um, their understanding of the way things are to verging then into public policy and, and what we should then as a population do about them, which seems to be a little bit more philosophical than, than scientific. Well, unfortunately, the way science, the, not, not real science, but the way science actually is, is done to get ahead as a scientist, you almost have to do that. We've created a system that makes it that, to be a successful scientist, to bring in large grants and all this type of stuff, mm. you more or less have to do that. I just wonder, somebody of the ilk of Einstein, 
uh, work, if he'd worked in climate science, he would have been a shy person who would have not talked to very many people, as most physicists are like that. Um, he would never have got it because he wouldn't have been able to talk to the politicians and write, write mm -hmm. great funding applications. He wouldn't want to blow things up to say the, the world is about to be end and all these sorts of things. So nowadays, unfortunately, to be a good scientist, you actually have to often be a very good politician at the same time. Wow, which which is inherently um, self defeating. It, it's counterproductive for somebody who's trying to be objective and empirical to be political and and have a right. objective in mind. And you have the same problem that the universities. I mean, I have a little dispute with my university at the moment, and we'll come to that. Yeah, yeah, but um, one of the things though is the universities themselves. Um, they need to get money. They, they're judged by how much money they get and how much research they produce. So that they end up being um, almost conflicted in their interests. Mm, beholden. They can't afford, they mm. can't afford to, to, uh, to have their gravy train rocked. Uh, mm. So we've got all these other problems that are occurring the way we carry out science, which mean that we can often get the wrong results. Yeah, that, that's... Um so the scientific method, just to, I guess, summarise, is it fair to say that the scientific method should never assume any fact is settled, but rather to be always questioning, always cynical, sceptical, um, looking to disprove everything that is considered accepted? Yes, looking to disprove and really going to do it. I mean, even now, Einstein's theory of relativity has been around for the general relativity for 103 years but even now we still do experiments to see whether at the seventh significant figure so to point oh 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 i've lost count one percent <laughs> yeah uh, accuracy does it yeah. still work wow now, so we we still want to know is it going yep. to fall over if we go to point oh, 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 oh one yep yep so um and that's the way you should do science and we should and this is what i'm saying we should take the science to the, say the great barrier reef or whatever you're working on and you should subject it and, and really go for it to see where it falls over. Rather than saying, no, no, 97% say it's all okay, um, it mm. must be okay, there's a consensus. Mm. And so how do you, what, what are you actually suggesting should be implemented? Is there, is there a, a short bullet point list of, of quality controls you would like to implement um, rather than, I guess, the broad statements that it needs to be tested? Yes, there, there are. In fact, I, I, there's a, a group of scientists who are writing a paper at the moment on the sorts of things that you can do to give yourself more um, confidence that the science is right. Um, hmm. And when the Queensland government or the federal government are proposing the taxpayer public money, a billion dollars be, yeah. be spent on this, it's probably worth checking to make sure the science is quality. Exactly, exactly. And I'm saying if you spent just 1% of that, on quality, you could, you could actually sort out almost all the science. There are only about a dozen science papers on the Great Barrier Reef which actually have data showing maybe, in my case not, that there's damage to the reef, all right? So you only have to check those ones out and do it maybe two or three times. And mm. you've got a, you can now say, yep, that one's right, this one is wrong, this one we're not sure about, we need to keep on doing it. Uh, so it's a relatively small thing, and it's relatively easy to identify these things. Mm. That number of a dozen uh, papers, I actually was talking to the, uh, the head of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority about this, and I asked him, how many science papers do we rest this whole edifice about the death of the reef on? And I had in my mind about 20, and he said almost immediately, about a dozen. Wow. So we're not talking about a huge amount of effort. To mm. There's a lot of yep. papers which refer to these dozen you know, there are hundreds, if not thousands of those. Right, right. Oh, the reef is dead because of all these reasons. And they refer back to this dozen papers. So it's not original research. No, that's right. But mm. the actual papers that show damage from global warming and, and these other things is a relatively small basket of papers and relatively easy to check. Yeah. Well, uh, in yesterday's news, I heard, and you might have seen as well, that our esteemed um, leader, Anastasia Palaszczuk has invited um, the world's previously esteemed leader, Barack Obama, to come and bring his family to Queensland and, and do a tour of the Great Barrier Reef to, to see how it's going. Because he famously 
um, wondered if the Great Barrier Reef would even be here in, I think it was 15 years, um, when, when he came here last um, as president. Um, now, I've been to the Great Barrier Reef. I've been on a, a, you know, a reef um, excursion with a, an operator, um, registered and, and very, very um, you know, proper about the way that they um, go about taking visitors out, being very careful to maintain its pristine environment. And one of the things that they begged everybody on, on the cruise to do, on the, on the excursion to do, was please go and tell everybody that the reef is fine. There's nothing wrong. It's great. Come on out and, and bring your mates. Because the tourism industry um, in, in Queensland and in North Queensland is being uh, severely affected by the hyperventilation and the fear generated um, internationally by the extreme environmentalists. So let's move the interview to your research on, on the reef and your criticism of, of the other research on the reef. What are the claims that are being made? Um, how are they false? And, and what's the real situation going on? Okay, so let, let's start with, there's, there's probably four of them. Um, the first one is the effect of climate change. So the, the temperature in North Queensland has changed by maybe half to three quarters of a degree over the last hundred years. And we certainly know that if you get extremely hot uh, events, uh, a large amount of coral will die. That's called bleaching. Um, but the fact is that bleaching has always occurred. I mean, there's these claims that it's only started to occur in the 1980s. But the fact is that well, we didn't really do much research on the reef before then, so we're just discovering something which has been going on forever, right. basically. Right. It turns out, though, that uh, as the temperature of the water gets hotter, corals grow better, generally. So the corals grow faster in the northern part of the reef than the southern part of the reef, and they grow much faster in New Guinea and Thailand where the, the corals live in water that's one or two degrees hotter. And one or two degrees hotter than, hotter than ours. And the same species of coral, right? Ah. So, uh, and it's, this is a well-established fact. Corals are a tropical species. They like it hot. So the Great Barrier Reef would actually be better off if the water was two degrees warmer on average. Undoubtedly. <laughs> Undoubtedly, it would be better off. Whoops. So, so there, there's one. And yes, yeah, sure, large amounts die when you get these extreme events. It's like a bushfire, very, very hot. The coral's not used to that. What they're able to do is that they take in the... A coral is made of a little animal that's just a, maybe a few millimetres across. There's hmm. millions of those in a coral bombing. And then you have inside that these things called zooxanthellae, which are little algae that produce the energy for it. And it turns out that a coral can take in different types of this zooxanthellae. So hmm. one type of zooxanthellae will be suitable for cold water, another suitable for hot water. And they can, these are floating around in the ocean. They can take them in and they reproduce inside. And they, you can actually have a coral that can, can adapt to either hot water or cold water like almost no other animal around, all right? We can't do that. Plants can't do that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, and they do that zooxanthellae shuffling very effectively. Hmm. So, you know, and of course, this is, this is obvious that they, the corals need to do that because if you're a, a coral egg or a coral larvae, you could drift into water that's very shallow where the water is maybe two degrees hotter or you could go to a place that is two degrees colder, maybe down south, depending on which way the, 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 the currents drift. Mm -hmm. So corals have to be able to adapt to massively changing temperatures because the larvae of a particular coral may end up being in a place which is one or two or more degrees hotter or colder than where the mother or the, 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 the original uh, coral was. Hmm. Um, so I don't think that I'm, you know, I think, yes, the temperature has risen, but I'm not, I cannot really see why we would expect the reef to be particularly affected by what is actually a relatively minor change in the temperature. All right, so we come on to another one, say the sediment. So we're also told that the sediments coming down all the rivers from the soil erosion on the farms is smothering the reef with sediment. Well, I've worked for over 25 years on this and it's just not right, okay? If you go to the outer Great Barrier Reef, which is in many places over 100 kilometres away from the, the rivers, there is no or almost no land-based sediment out there. It's all coral sand, Okay the sediment never gets there. Some of the inshore reefs, say around Townsville where I am, um, there's some little reefs just around 
say a couple of the islands and they will get a bit of sediment but essentially these areas are all surrounded by a lot of fine sediment from the rivers over the last um, thousands of years and that sediment gets resuspended every time we get a strong wind all right resuspended means stirred up yeah the waves resuspend the, the sediment and it, mm -hmm. it goes over, over the reefs. Well, they're used to that those are inshore reefs different types of coral and they're quite capable of that so for example um the, the extreme is a cyclone for example and a, a big cyclone like cyclone yasi probably resuspended around half a billion cubic meters of sediment Wow. There's all the, the um, you know, a, a layer this, this deep <laughs> of uh, sediment right over where it went would have been resuspended and then redumped down. Wow. All the, all the stuff coming out of the rivers in a year might, might amount to a few million cubic metres. So cyclones and the southeasterly trade winds are the things which determine how much sediment the inshore reefs receive. That's 1% of the sediment, of, of the corals. But the outer reef, 99%, it effectively almost never gets any uh, sediment at all. So this idea that we're smothering coral with sediment, it, it's just, it almost beggars belief. You know, the, the, as a hypothesis, it, it's, it's a ridiculous hypothesis. Uh, I look at the global warming hypothesis, you know, CO2, yes, there's more CO2 in the atmosphere. CO2 is a greenhouse gas, so it should cause warming. And we have warmed, all right, it's a useful hypothesis. But the sediment hypothesis doesn't even make sense because we're putting in a very small amount of sediment a long way away from the reef. We can't measure any sediment on the 99% of the reefs. It's not even a good hypothesis to start testing. Hmm. Okay, so the next one would be nutrients. So the nutrients from fertilizer, yep. on partic particularly cane farms, is supposed to create a phytoplankton bloom Phytoplankton is basically um, little plants that live in, the, uh, live in the water, makes the water go a bit green. Mm -hmm. and then the crown of thorns starfish are supposed to eat that, the larvae, and it creates a plague of crown of thorns starfish. So they're blaming the uh, crown of thorns starfish outbreaks on the, uh, the fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Right, now the first thing is they again claim that crown of thorns starfish outbreaks are unnatural because we only discovered those in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Mm. Well, again, that's because we didn't have scuba gear, we didn't have science institutions. And when you do, when you put a, you drill a hole in a reef, you can actually find skeletons of crown of thorns and we know that they've been there since. So that's like archaeological evidence yeah, that... Right. Yeah. The his, history before we were swimming around under the water. Exactly. So 50 we know years that ago. they were there in large numbers well before we had cane farms. Okay. We also know that there's plenty of places where there is no agriculture. You know, the western part of uh, of Australia where there's coral reefs, where you get crown of thorns, starfish plagues, hmm. and um, there is no agriculture there. So it doesn't make sense. They then use a, a, a particular argument that they supposedly measure double the phytoplankton concentrations in the region offshore from the, where the farms are relative to the northern region. But when I look at that data and reanalyze it, in fact, they've made some fundamental mistakes. In fact, there is no difference between the two. Really? So you've got a... a, a what kind of mistakes are they making? They just can't add up two plus two or... It's, not, it's more complicated than that. It's Good. It's <laughs> I hope so. That's the, essentially the width of the, the shelf. So it's the, the distance between the land and the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's probably a bit too complicated to go in, but, but I okay. think a fundamental um, mistake in that. Um, so you've got a hypothesis which really is fairly implausible to start with, and in my view, the data doesn't support it. But of course, what I would say is that we can argue about you know, whether I'm right or the other scientists are right about this doubling in the phytoplankton, but what we should do is go off and duplicate that experiment again, mm. again and again Mm. But we're not going to do that. So we've got this one measurement, which I think is probably wrong, and we're not going to do it again. But we're going to tell the cane farmers they have to reduce mm. the nitrogen loss from their farms, and that's more or less how much they put on, by 80%. And this will massively affect the viability of the cane farming industry, which is not wow. doing too well at the moment anyway. So we're basing on extremely dubious science. One scientific paper, which in my view is probably wrong. Flawed. It's, yep. it's, a, sho it's a shocking situation. Yeah, and, and that's, the, that's the need. That's all you're saying is 
is if we're going to impact industry and invest public money significantly, let's have some quality control for the science that's instead of just believing the first paper that comes out. And that's right. And this is it. One paper, which we we're not going to bother. I and mean, in fact, we, we, we really don't want to check it because we might find that it's actually wrong and the whole edifice will fall down in a, a, a mm. well, that's the opposition in my view. Mm. So yes, we just need to check it. It's all actually based on, you know, you might think that this crown of thorns nutrients link is based on a hundred papers where we've checked, tested and replicated. No, uh, uh, one paper. And I think it's wrong. Yep. So, um, so that's, so we've done global war, the, the warming, we've done nutrients, we've done, uh, sediment. Then there's the dredging thing. Uh, the dredging, dredging thing is another, um, sediment story. Um, and the, the, the amount of sediment that drifts away from the dredges is actually relatively small. But come back to the nutrients, by the way, it is a very implausible hypothesis because if you actually, yeah, on the seabed, there's a lot of nutrients that cycle across the seabed. And it turns out there's about 100 times more nutrients that cycle across the seabed every year than come down all the rivers, all the rivers uh, in a whole year. So the actual rivers where the, the, this fertilizer comes down is a very minor player in wow. the nutrient cycle. So the yeah. yeah. As, as always with environmental science, there are a lot of inputs. And to attribute any one trend to one of the inputs, um, look, me as a lay person, you know, my first job was a plumber. Um, you know, to, to me as a, a lay person to, you know, to attribute, you know, all of global warming to human industrial behavior, um, dismissing the impacts of, of, you know, the oceans and, and the currents and the sun and, you know, all of the inputs that environment has. That's right. And the fact that just we, naive, that it's simplistic massively over any time scale from 10, 100,000 mm. years. So it's, it's varied over all these time scales and just to attribute it to that yep. based on a few models, um, yep. it just doesn't, it's not a good, that's not science. Yeah, no, that, that is, is silly. Tell me more about um, dredging because I'm a, personally, it's one of my, my pet policies. Um, you know, I, I think there's massive amounts of regional economic development, employment, um, tourism and commercial activities that can be built if the river mouths around Australia uh, are just dredged to allow a lot of river access and to allow safe access yeah. um, for commercial vehicles. I think we could take a lot of trucks off the road if we were able to freight via water, which would be very good for the environment because yeah. water travels a lot less impactful on the environment than, you know, a hundred thousand semi trailers. Mm, yeah. Well, look, I've done a lot of work on dredging. In fact, we invented some of the, um, the instruments that are now used everywhere around the world uh, to measure sediments in water over long periods. Um, so we've been doing that for 25 years and we monitor, well, when I, when I used to work at James Cook University, we used to monitor uh, dredges. Um, and so we've done it. We've got a lot of data. We've got more data than anybody else in Australia and probably more than virtually anybody else in the world on how far, you know, the dredge, the dredge, the, the effect of the dredge, the dirty water goes. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just a few kilometres at most. So there was wow. a big, there was a big um, uh, campaign out in uh, Western Australia on Barrow Island where, where we had a, a number of instruments at different uh, distances away from the dredge up to, you know, 20 or 30 kilometres away. But mm. the effect of the dredging only went to one or two kilometres away. Mm. Most of these, most of the ports in, in Queensland, for instance, on the Great Barrier Reef, are a long way, like 100 kilometres in, in wow. Yep. away from the main meat. What about mangroves and things like that? What's the impact of dredging on, oh, on the... No. Nothing? Nothing at all. No, provided you don't actually dredge the mangrove itself. But the mm. drift, if you're dredging out at sea and there's mangroves within a few kilometres... What about the river mouths, like I'm suggesting, that, I'm a fan of? That can affect it in some rather subtle ways. So if you, if you change the hydrodynamics by opening up a river mouth, you can actually allow more water into a, uh, a river and the, the tidal range can actually change a little bit. So you could actually affect the mangroves in that way. But I was talking before more about uh, the drift of sediment onto a mangrove that tends not to have a great deal of effect. Interesting. Uh, th there is certainly uh, some of the, the, um, 
the, the ports up here are quite close to some corals. So uh, in Townsville, you're within a, a couple of kilometres from corals and they may get a very, very small effect. But it's actually almost, well, we've never actually been able to measure it. That doesn't mean it's not, there's not an effect. It's just mm. know what we can measure. But it's certainly not a massive effect. And you're talking about uh, corals that are naturally living in a very muddy environment, right? So mm. it tells us on Cleveland Bay, there's a big shipping channel that goes through it. The reason that they need to dredge the shipping channel every year is because there's a lot of sediment that's moving around that falls in the channel, right? Mm. So you've got a naturally muddy environment that the corals are, are living next to. And the dredging is just a little bit of extra on top of that. It might be an extra 10%, but probably not even that. Yep extra on that now you mentioned you're in townsville and you also mentioned that you're no longer working for james cook university um this thursday night which uh for those people watching this weeks and months away from now um was um and will be the 24th of may thursday night the 24th of may in townsville i'm going to get to meet you face to face for the first time this is the first time we've met video to video um, and, and it's a free speech forum where there will be um, yourself and me, uh, along with three other panellists, uh, are being invited to discuss the, the impacts of political correctness on free speech. Um, so I encourage all viewers, um, you know, come along and check it out. If you're in the Townsville region, um, definitely, definitely uh, Grab a ticket as soon as you can and, and be there. It'll be an exciting um, discussion, uh, undoubtedly very robust, around the, the impacts of political correctness, which is a blight on uh, our democracy and freedom. Tell me now, though, uh, give us a sneak peek into, oh, actually, don't be, don't be too short. Um, tell us the details. Why has your university fired you for asking for greater quality controls of the science that public policy and expenditure is relying upon? Well, I made statements essentially talking about this replication crisis that, that the science can't be trusted and therefore science institutions, the work coming from them cannot be trusted because they're not applying enough quality. And I got hit with misconduct allegations for saying that. And they also said that I wasn't allowed to talk about the fact that I'd been charged with these misconduct allegations. And, wow. And I said, well, no, no, you, you can't do that, actually. I agree. Uh, I'm going to talk about that because this is important. So then they got upset about me talking about it and they then read through all my emails to see if they could dig up some dirt. I'm very happy to say they, they dug up nothing, which I'm, I'm um, ashamed of at all. But they found other instances where I'd mentioned the fact and... Uh, they got upset. They sent me allegations because I'd actually sent information to my wife. I had an allegation that I wasn't allowed. They're now saying, oh, no, no, we, we never, ever meant that somehow. But, but they did. And it was very, very frightening. It was, it was very frightening, actually. Um, they also dis wouldn't make up a decision. We then took them to court. We said, we're going to court. Uh, they may, then suddenly decided to make a decision. We're going to give you a final censure, but you're not allowed to talk about it. You're not allowed to talk to anybody about it. And I again said, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, people need to know what's going on. You're effectively gagging me because you're not allowing me to effectively say the things which I need to say about quality assurance. And um, There are two major concerns I have with what you've told me so far. The first is that, that your reputation is stymied, is muddied by the censure and the disciplinary actions that that the university is has taken and has been known to have taken. It, it impacts your reputation. Um, for them to deny you the ability to equally publicly defend your reputation and provide your context for for comments yeah. is is essentially anti is it's totalitarian. <laughs> Look, I tend to agree. Um, but it's actually, and the other thing, by telling you that you're not allowed to talk to anybody about it, they deny you the ability to get help. 
Well, that's that's the second problem I have is that it's it's David versus Goliath. It's yep. this professor who's on a professor's salary versus the vast resources of a university administration. Exactly. And so, so how example, are you meant to raise legal fees if you can't tell your story? Well, I, I was I was literally packing up my bag. This was in August last year. I mean, I have been finally fired, but I thought I was going to be fired at the end of August. I was literally packing up my room and packing up my computer and doing all the things. And I broke the university order, which, I, which we think is an illegal order. We, mm-hmm. we, that's going to be decided by a judge, actually, whether they're mm-hmm. allowed to do this. And I said to the Institute of Public Affairs, it looks like I'm going to get fired. Uh, now, that was against what JCU said I was allowed to do. Mm. Um, now, because that happened, they then got me some legal help and we managed to put that date. I, the IPA got you some legal help. That's right. Yep. Uh, now, since then, we've um, I've paid for my own legal help. They, they provided a little bit and I've provided a lot and we've now got a lot of public support from a GoFundMe campaign. Um, but if I hadn't initially been able to get that help by talking about it, then I can't defend myself. And more recently, James Cook has been upset with me for doing a crowdfunding campaign about the fact that I've got a misconduct and trying to fight to, to raise legal fees. How dare you defend yourself against our allegations? <laughs> exactly. And the, the trouble is that I can't go to people and say, oh, look, I've got these serious misconduct allegations against me and I'd like you to give me some money, like $100,000 worth. They're going to think, well, what are these serious misconduct allegations? Have you been doing something to the first year ladies or something like that? Yes. I have to give all the information and that's what I've done. I put it mm. all up. Mm. All the allegations are yes. up and decide whether I'm right or wrong. Yeah. I, I think I'm right and... Uh, but I've got to be completely straight and honest about that. But by doing that, I now go against the order that I've got to keep it all confidential, an order which we believe is illegal. Of course it is. And it has this sort of totalitarian... Yeah. I don't think it's very different to the secret prosecution um, of Callum Thwaites and co um, by the, the other Queensland University where... Um, they weren't even aware of the charges against them and therefore unable to mount a defence. Um, for you to be banned from mounting a defence and preparing, you know, fundraising, you know, is, is tantamount to a secret prosecution again. It, it, it is. And that's, as I say, I've now got, what's it, there's around 40 serious misconduct allegations and well over half of those. Who's your QC if he doesn't mind being named? Look, I'm not sure whether he does mind being named, so I, I, I'll need to check with that. But he's a very, very good one, if I can say that. Okay. And, um, but uh, yeah, we've got to. You've got to be able to talk about these things. This is a public institution. It's mm. a university. Yep. If the person who's who's got these allegations, me, doesn't mind them becoming public, then he should be able to say, "Look, that's right." Here. That's right. Now, in fact, these confidential. If the university did hold them hold themselves blameless in their action. Uh, what would they have to fear? Well, this is this is the thing. You know, if it was so bad, if if what they had done is all above board, mm. then why do they want to keep me quiet? It's incredibly suspicious that that they don't want you and Australia, you talking and Australia knowing uh, about their conduct in this in this whole scenario. Because at the end of the day, what is this serious misconduct? It it is that you have called, criticised the scientific community and, the sci- and some scientists, I guess, and, and the studies and research in particular, and said that these are, not being, these are flawed and need to be better tested. There needs to be better quality control. That doesn't amount to serious misconduct for me. In, in, fact, in fact, I think criticism between the scientific community is not a... Um, is not, and antithetical to collegiate behaviour, no. collegial behaviour, I, I think it's it's actually helpful. Like the legal system we have, it is adversarial because it's meant to be cynical. Nothing should be assumed. Everything should be rigorously tested in yeah. in the court of scientific process or in the court of 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 our legal system. These things need to have an adversary holding to account these opinions um, and conclusions which so much public money and public good rests entirely upon. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. That's essentially what I'm saying. Science needs, can actually learn a huge amount from the legal system 
you know, you will always have a prosecution. You will always have a defense uh, mm. in science. We'll have either a prosecution or defense. I don't know which one, but there's no guarantee you'll have the other side. And that's what the peer review system should be. It should be critical analysis. analysis. It should be a process of disproving the claims. Yeah, and sometimes it can be. It's just not enough. You know, mm. it's just not enough. That's the problem. Mm. But, but, of course, the case with JCU became much more than that. You know, we ended up with these confidentiality arguments and... Uh, and some fairly intimidating behaviour in terms... I mean, one of them, the beautiful ones, is I sent an email to a, a friend uh, with the, the subject line, for your amusement. And I didn't talk about my case, but I attached a newspaper article about my case. Um, and because I used the word amusement, JCU said that I had parodied, vilified and trivialised the disciplinary process. And that was another serious misconduct allegation. Just the words for your amusement. I'm not even allowed to say for your amusement about what they were doing to me, which, by the way, I don't find very amusing at all. The thought police are out in force and you may not be amused. Political correctness gone absolutely crazy. Absolutely. I, I read this, I, I actually did laugh. I thought they can't be serious. They, of course, they yeah. can't be serious, but mm. they were. It's in my, it's in my dismissal uh, document that I had trivialised, parodied, and I've forgotten the third word, the, the disciplinary process. Yep. It's, um, it, it seems to be, if not entirely the case, frequently and predominantly the case nowadays that academic freedom has been replaced by academic authoritarianism. Yep. Absolutely no doubt about it. And just look, look what's happened to me. What's the signal that will go out to every other person at JCU yep. and all the other universities? Mm. The other universities aren't, aren't any better. It has a muting effect on the entire academic community Absolutely. and makes Australia a, a facile pool of shallow thinking where nobody dare challenge the status quo, that the orthodoxy, the prevalent opinion cannot be challenged or questioned publicly for fear of censure and career suicide. It has a chilling effect, a muting effect on the entire process which we need to be robust and adversarial. That's right. And UK and Canada and Australia, you name it. And, it, mm. you know, the, the thing is that you don't need to scare people very much to stop them going near the cliff edge. I've been walking next mm -hmm. to the cliff edge for a few, many years, decade or so, wow. knowing that sooner or later, you know, I was going to fall over because I'd get be got. Mm. You know, and for other people, they're going to really question, well, where is the edge of the cliff? And... For me, that's uh, right. Was the end of my my uh, career. My my children are out, um, and I, I've got good superannuation, and I can take these risks. And I took the risk, and I've I've paid for it. What a shame that it takes four decades to get to that position. <laughs> yes. Well, but other people, younger younger scientists who have children at, at school, who have a mortgage. Mm they're not going to go anywhere near that cliff. They're not going to get anywhere. They're just not going to get involved in this debate mm. uh, because they cannot afford to. The chilling effect, absolutely a chilling effect. Mm. Dr. Peter Ridd, how much more will the rest of this legal battle um, likely cost? Well, we, we, we raised about a hundred grand. Um, we'd used a significant fraction of that. We were now, we while we're talking, we've got a GoFundMe campaign where we're trying to get another 160. Wow. Um, it's expensive. Mm, um, you know, no doubt. You know, these battles, you've not just got to be right. You've got to have legal fun. Mm. Now, ancient legal advice given to me was he who has the most money wins. Well, I don't think it's entirely true. <laughs> if you don't go into this, you know, really going to win with a good legal team, you're going mm. to lose, in which case yeah. don't bother. Yeah, so we get, we're going in my legal team. They're pretty confident. Yeah. And I think we've got a great case. Uh, we just need the money to make it happen. And I think we're going to get there. Great. Well, if you'd like to help, if you're watching this uh, interview or listening to it um, via podcast or radio, uh, let me encourage you to jump on to davepello.com and find the the post with this interview in it. Or if you're watching and you can, um, you'll, open up the description beneath the video you'll find the link to the gofundme campaign there we're not just helping peter Reed. 
we're helping ourselves. This is an important uh, watershed moment in Australian and legal and academic um, journey, jurisprudence. We need this win for academic freedom. We need this win for democracy because no less than a billion dollars of public tax money is being um, rested upon and entire agricultural industries, um, and that's just in this one instance. What about the land clearing laws that have recently passed in Queensland based on bad science? There is so much about public life in Australia which rests on science, and we need academic freedom to make sure that those politicians, that oligarchy, that small group of people with power wanting to preserve it um, with whatever trendy emotions can be manipulated at that time through, through fear and, and love, we actually need that scientists to be able to stand up and say, good science, bad science, let's repeat it, let's disprove it. Um, and we can't do that if the scientists and academics aren't able to confidently stand up and, and argue their case. And freedom of speech has a consequence. That consequence should not be a career loss. It should be criticism. That's it. Freedom of speech should beget freedom of speech. Um, but it, we need to put our money where our mouth is because the government's not going to defend academic freedom by fighting this court battle. Dr. Peter Ridd has to fight this all by himself. Let's not leave him by himself. Um, let's chip in and make this campaign successful and the legal case successful. It's not throwing good money after bad. There's a good chance of a win here, but it won't be if some decent lawyers can't be, um, you know, paid. And um, that's something you and I can do, whether it's a small amount or a big amount. Um, please chip in at that GoFundMe link there. Are there any other thoughts um, or, or discussion points we should um, cover off? I think we could go on for hours, but it's probably enough for now. In, indeed we could. So if you would like more, uh, make sure you check out the debate in uh, or the forum, the Political Correctness Free Speech Forum in Townsville this Thursday night, the 24th of May. Um, you'll be able to find links to that on my Facebook page, also beneath this video. Um, grab a ticket. I think it's only $10. Um, it's going to be at the RSL Stadium, and um, that's this Thursday night. We'll see if we can make the video available after the event for those people that are, are out of the area. But come along, ask um, Dr. Peter Ridd some questions, ask me some questions. I'll be talking about political correctness in the media. We'll also be talking about political correctness in the Defence Forces with Bernard Gaynor, in politics um, with Lyle Shelton, um, and in religion with uh, James McPherson. Um, so the, the young Australian conservatives in North Queensland have organised this event. It's going to be fantastic. Get along and support that as well. And um, in the meantime, if you'd also like to become a partner of this show, Pello Talk, um, we get keep bringing conversations like this to you, care of very generous viewers. It's entirely viewer funded. Don't get any corporate or political sponsorship. Um, you can become a monthly partner for as little as $3.00. And um, we also have an equipment fundraiser. But feel free to put that aside for this week and um, support Dr. Peter Ridd's GoFundMe. Those links are in the video as well. Subscribe to weekly updates or regular updates. They're actually not very weekly. Um, from my website, davepello.com. And um, if this is the first video you've watched of mine on YouTube, click the little bell icon um, above this video so you can be notified um, and subscribe to the channel. But uh, that's it for this episode of Pillow Talk. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Peter Ridd, for joining me. Thank you very much. And to the viewers, stay true.